This is the panel titled, Let's Be Honest. And uh, it's going to be led by the dean of uh, Bayonne Claremont College, uh, Jihad Turk. And the personal story, uh, Jad and I actually grew up uh, in Arizona when he was still in diapers. He was a lot cuter then, a lot more handsome now, more dapper in his attire, obviously. Um, but Jihad has uh, definitely been involved in many of the issues that we're talking about and, and probably knows everybody in this room. He's one of the best networkers we know. Um, and I'd like to challenge Jihad that as we get the, I'm sure all these bright panelists we have are gonna, we're gonna get their opinions, but I think one of the issues that we need to talk about also is how do we create institutional change, not just giving personal analysis. We're not going to rely just on charismatic leadership anymore, but what institutional discipline do we need to, um, to have and institutional change we need to make to move the meter forward on this issue? Uh, because a lot of people like to go and just uh, clench the fist and protest, uh, and everyone has that right to do that. It, it also helps the issue stay alive. But at the end of the day, what do we do to create that institutional change to deal with institutional racism. Um, so we're going to let Jihad run this panel. I'd like to also announce this is an opportunity for you, all of you, to win a prize from MPAC. If you tweet during the convention with the hashtag pound MPAC14, five times you can receive a free mug with obviously non-alcoholic uh, beverages, or notebook outside at the MPAC table. Now, if you, are, if you are the top tweeter at today's convention and tonight's banquet, you'll receive a notebook, a mug, and a copy of The True American, Murder and Mercy in Texas, and we're gonna talk about that later. Um, the author of which is, and the hero of that, uh, Raisa Dean Buyan, uh, are gonna be with us tonight at, at the banquet. So remember, hashtag MPAC14, and uh, you get a prize. Thank you. I said that right. These are, the, 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 whoop is, is the, the whoop is from people who know I am completely illiterate on these issues. So with that, the hashtag Jihad, is the pound, by the way. Yeah, the, I, I, I figured that out later. I'm thinking on my feet here. So with that, Jihad Turk, thank you. Thank you, Salam, I think, for that introduction. Um, we're going to have a conversation, and you're invited to listen in. But really, it's going to be us on the stage that are, uh, we're, going to, we're going to have a conversation about real, real issues. And this is my dream panel, because I know uh, everyone personally, I just got to know Marwa Ali uh, recently, but I, I've, I've known and, and interacted with, dealt with uh, these other individuals on stage. Their bios are in the book. And so I'm not going to read their bios. I'll just give their names and their titles uh, and say a brief word about each one. However, um, I'll say about all of them collectively that they're leaders in their own right. Uh, and a leader isn't someone who is off on their own with visionary ideas. But a leader is someone who has clarity of vision, but also has the integrity of character uh, the discipline of uh, engagement and a sensitivity by having a, a, their finger on the pulse of what issues are, are, are important to the community to uh, engage with the community and help move the community forward in a direction uh, furthering our, our, our community along towards that, that vision. And so uh, with that, um, I'm going to introduce the, the speakers and then dive right into uh, a topic that and this is about, you know, and I love the, 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 this Let's Be Honest uh, uh, program that MPAC's been putting on, not just here at the convention, but all around the, the country, all around here in Southern California. I've been on panels before, and, and really, it's, it's such an exciting conversation to, you know, to, to, to bring to the community. Let's be honest, all kinds of things come up, and it's really a vibrant, a vibrant way to engage the community and to uh, help our leadership understand what, what really is at stake. So um, our, uh, our, our, my, the first speaker here to my immediate left is Hind Meki. And 
We, uh, she is the, the, uh, the, the, the curator and the, the founder of a, of a blog called Side Entrance, and I'll let her talk a little bit more about that, but again, her bio's in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in the program. Uh, and, I, and I've been a follower of Hind on, on Twitter for a, a while, and it wasn't until we were both in a conference in Doha that we finally met in person. And she's uh, as impressive in person as she is online, but she's a force to be reckoned with online as well. Uh, Rami, Dr. Rami Neshashibi is one of the most phenomenal uh, leaders that, that I know of in the American Muslim community. Uh, not only did we uh, invite him to serve on our faculty at Bayan Claremont to teach a course on community organizing, uh, because the master's degree that we offer at Bayan isn't just Islamic studies, it's Islamic studies and leadership, and part of what leadership entails is uh, being relevant for the youth, being relevant for, to bringing together various aspects and demographics within the community to serve society and how, and how to do that. And so uh, Dr. Rami Neshashibi, over uh, almost two decades ago, uh, uh, co-founded or founded and, and serves, has been serving as executive director of Inner City Muslim Action Network uh, in the south side of Chicago and is doing phenomenal work. I had the, the blessing to be at his banquet uh, and was inspired last Saturday night in Chicago. And it was a little bit colder than it is here, I have to tell you, so I don't think he's, he's hurting in this temperature. And then the co-producer of Unmasked, which is a phenomenon uh, uh, sweeping across our, our uh, communities here in the United States, uh, and was captured in this documentary, Unmasked. Uh, Marwa Ali uh, is gonna be speaking about uh, some of those issues. And then, of course, Imam Jihad Safir, uh, is uh, not just a good name, and he's, he's helping to redefine the name Jihad, because with a name like Jihad, you're a walking teaching moment. And, but when you have someone like Imam Jihad Safir, uh, living, uh, li uh, living example of what it means to be uh, a change agent, someone who's transforming the society and the community from which he comes, um, it, it's making uh, carrying the name Jihad a little bit easier. Uh, he's a graduate of Bayan Claremont, uh, he's serving as an imam of Masjid Ibadullah, and he also is the founder of not only Islah LA, and it's an Islamic school, and it's transforming the, the south side of LA, but um, he also uh, started his own nonprofit called Demise to Rise, and is helping people who've embraced Islam in prison transition back into productive roles in society once they, once they come out and uh, is also serving as a chaplain in a prison, and that's just the beginning, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So we have some dynamic individuals here on stage, and so um, I'm looking forward to a conversation, and you're invited into the conversation in the following way. There are cards that are being distributed, we have uh, volunteers that are gonna be picking up those cards. If you could come forward so everyone can see, raise your hand. You can, if you want a card, just raise your hand and they'll be distributed to you. There's already someone in the back who has his hand raised. We didn't even start. Boy, that's enthusiasm. All right. And uh, the, the cards will be forwarded to me, and I'll be interjecting uh, some of the questions into the conversation. So we're going to be talking to each other. Ignore them. The pretend they're not here. But really have a conversation with each other. And what was interesting, and I'm going to get right into it now, what was interesting in uh, preparing for this panel is I had the opportunity to reach out to each of you beforehand and... Uh, get a sense of what it is that you wanted to talk about. But as we got closer to the event, there was a controversy that, that began to, to brew uh, in MPAC's decision to uh, award, for a partnership award, an LAPD officer, uh, Chief, Chief Di Michael Downing. And uh, he'll be receiving this honor uh, uh, this evening. And um, there was a letter that was circulated. I'm gonna just read some excerpts. It was a three-page letter. How many of you saw the letter? All right, just a handful. So uh, there's this thing called the internets, and they have, uh, uh, and there's, uh, uh, but, but on, on social media, it was only uh, in the last few days, so I don't blame you if you didn't see it, but there was some, some controversy uh, surrounding MPAC's decision, and a letter that was circulated and signed by some prominent members in the community and some prominent organizations. 150, I think, was the, the number of signatories just before the beginning of the conference. And it was entitled, The War at Home, Bowing Down to White Supremacy. And I'm just gonna read the first paragraph and the last one. The streets are on fire. The most widespread social upheaval 
in at least a generation has engulfed the United States as the questions and concerns around policing and its brutality has taken center, uh, has taken center stage. In this vo volatile and urgent time, we find it deeply troubling and offensive to those who are protesting, to the families who have lost loved ones, and to those who have lost their lives that the Muslim Public Affairs Council, MPAC, would choose to honor Los Angeles Police Department's uh, Deputy Chief Michael Downing for the Community Partnership Award at its annual banquet on December 13th, 2014. And as it, uh, it goes on to list all of the, the transgressions of the police department and the role that uh, Deputy Chief Downing has played in issues relating to mapping of the American Muslim community and other things. As a, and then it concludes, as a people of conscience, we cannot continue to support repressive policies in the name of political expediency and what amounts to rank opportunism, particularly when it's at the expense of the very black and brown communities that many of us come from. Let's stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters who are protesting and raising their voices and let us abandon our desires for quote unquote honorary whiteness for there is no truth to this lie. The sooner we realize this, the closer we will get to real political engagement. Wake up, MPAC, you are on the wrong side of history. So I received this on my Facebook, tweet, uh, Facebook feed, and uh, one of, the, one of the, the comments I got, and we're gonna be honest here, was F MPAC, let me just make sure I quote it correctly. <laughs> there were some other letters in there. Um, they are going down, I'm sick of this BS, not in my name, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there was, there was some, you know, uh, vulgar language, there was some hostility, there was some assertion that what MPAC is doing, there's an intentionality there uh, regarding. So my first question to all of you is, how many of you, how many of you read this letter? All right, so two of you. Did, did either of you face any pressure not to attend or to, or to sign on to the letter? So just jump in, either, either one of you. Make sure that the mic is on as well. Okay. Okay, I will be lahim in shaitan regime. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. So yeah, I I was notified via Twitter. I think a couple of folks uh, made me aware of this issue a couple of days ago, and then I I think at least on one occasion was asked to consider withdrawing from the panel and from the conference, um, and so. And, you know, and part of the response was to have the conversation discussion that we had to be able to, to talk very critically, very openly about these type of decisions and be able to kind of have the type of public engagement that uh, with a little more nuance that sometimes social media, of course, doesn't allow you to have. Uh, and, to take, and to take both sides of these types of narratives uh, very seriously. You know, I know we're kind of saying it in jest, and sometimes the polarizing language kind of lends itself to a chuckle or two, but I think we should not dismiss the extraordinary pain and suffering that underlines the sentiments in that letter. Uh, this is, you know, it is also, it's a moment, you know, the, and, and I know this was beyond the foresight of the organizers here at this conference, but it just so happens that today across the country, uh, this is a national day of, you know, protest. Uh, and so in every, in many major cities, people are coming out in, in record numbers uh, to essentially uh, speak to what uh, Dr. Faldot has talked about. And, and the fact that this is undoubtedly, and, and for those of us who've been living and organizing this stuff, you know, beyond, Michelle Anderson's, you know, uh, New Jim Crow, the realities of just extraordinary disparities in, in, in incarceration rates, uh, in indices, every indice that we can think about from over the last three decades continues to perpetuate a reality that by and large, the, the, the broader immigrant Muslim community, and, and of, of whom I, I'm a son of, and a proud Palestinian with deep roots in Palestine, but we have to be honest about that. And the in, injunction that you know, uh, we heard in the, in, in the initial uh, Quranic uh, opening, right? and even if it means against ourselves, we have by and large been either uh, tone deaf or dismissive of this narrative, and not just simply dismissive uh, from a distance. 
our it's not a matter of just a historical record, right? Our communities are very implicated in the realities of these situations. Well, I mean, just to just to uh, dive right into it, I remember growing up in Phoenix, and the people who were who were bankrolling the masjid had liquor stores in African American neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, a, this was this was just the reality. I'm not naming any names, but you know, I don't think it's just a historical occurrence either. I think that there's still, you know, those kinds of issues. And we had here, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, after Rodney King, we had the, 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 the protests in southern, southern Los Angeles. Um, you know, a lot of resentment existed between not, not just blacks and whites, but also blacks and Koreans, many of which had liquor stores in black neighborhoods. Those kinds of things. I mean, is that what you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, almost every urban center in America in the since 70s, 80s, and 90s, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, Oakland, you know, mi what sociologists talk about as middleman minorities are predominantly, and this is not only the fault of Arab and other, you know, South Asian, in some cases, uh, businessmen. This is a broader systemic issue of white supremacy and structural racism that still permeates permeates every facet of our society. And so, yes, they're owned by, in many cases still today, they're owned by Arabs, owned by Palestinians, and let's be real, uh, the reality of this kind of charge of, you know, uh, this aspirational whiteness, if you will, right, this brown skin privilege. You know, look, our, look my, my family is a living example of it. I love my family, but they came, you know, Palestinians post-19, my, my mother's family, one of the first Palestinian families grew up on the southwest side of Chicago. Her name was Jihad, right? But it became Nancy. That's a whole other issue that I had to reconcile, that some women are named Jihad, too. That was a... <laughs> Probably more worthy recipients of the name to our, to our <laughs> women, right? Uh, kind of living out the name, inshallah. Not, not, to, uh, not to say anything about our beloved brothers here on stage. But, but the, the reality for people like my mother's family growing up in the, in, in the southwest side of Chicago in white working class neighborhoods in the 50s and the 60s, and she came before the 1965 look, is either proximity to whiteness was either a survival tactic, right, or it was an absolute kind of formula for what you, you did to succeed in America. It was just, you know, you did that. So the names all changed. I mean, today she's known as Nancy. Like, the kids went from Maher to Mickey to Imad to Joey. That's just the reality. They grew up with those names. And the last name was Daoud, and they grew up with Daoud. So it was like Mickey Daoud, the, the Palestinian Irish kid from the Southwest out of Chicago, <laughs> right? You know, and, and, and that was, but that, that sense of this larger narrative about whiteness and about its tensions in urban centers is not a conversation we've had publicly, really. We haven't. And it's not to implicate any one of our, I mean, it's the solutions, we can't have formulaic, to, you know, 140 character tweetable solutions. I mean, we need to get deep into the institutional mechanisms of this, but we have to have honest conversations. And, and, and that's why I applaud MPAC for allowing us to bring this publicly and engage the issues in having these type of things, because we need this. Very good, thank you very much, Rami. So Hind, what, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, is this, this is working, right? Yeah, you can keep it closer if you want. Okay. I also received uh, tweets and personal emails. I wasn't asked to sort of to re renounce my uh, acceptance of the invitation, which I was invited several months ago, you know, before even Ferguson exploded. Um, but I was certainly asked by several people, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about MPAC honoring, you know, this guy from the LAPD? Now, I'm from Chicago, and we have our own problems with uh, the police and institutionalized brutality, specifically against black and Latino communities. Um, but I don't know anything about LA. And, and that's, that's my response to them was, you know, from my topic is let's talk about honest issues. Let's talk about the taboo topics. And I'm sure that we'll be discussing this. And I'm, I'm really, again, like Rami was saying, I'm happy that we are having this conversation. Um, but the larger, the, I, I'd like to step back because for me, the fact that I received these, uh, the, these, the, these comments, you know, via social media, this has been a year of Facebook fitna. This has been a year of social media warfare on every topic that you could imagine, you know, starting from, from March, you know, there was a whole, con a whole controversy about 
can a religious leader, a religious scholar, kind of use Twitter to essentially make fun of International Women's Day? What does feminism mean for the Muslim community? What are the roles of the scholars as, as teachers in one way and respected, trusted people, but then they're using this public medium to really sort of tell really off-color personal jokes, as, as he calls them jokes, but other people took them more seriously. And then all the way you know, through the summer, we all know, with the um, with boycott, the White House iftar, and that was an, a whole other situation that happened. Can you clarify that just a little bit? Because not everyone might be plugged oh, into right. the White not House boycott not, controversy. Not everyone is literally tweeting right now. <laughs> um, but it, essentially, in, in the summer, during in, in the height of the invasion and, and the attack on Gaza, there was the White House invited, as they do every year, invited Muslims from across the country to attend their iftar. And they highlighted and honored several people from across the country. And the, the controversy became, should we boycott you know, the, this, this particular iftar, should we boycott this president that is using drones and that has, you know, ramped up the war on, on terror, so-called war on terror, and attacking Muslims everywhere um, abroad, as well as the civil liberties issues here in the United States? Or should we attend the iftar and use that as a way to engage government, not just the White House, but other members of government? Now. This is, I think, it's a very valid conversation. It's a very valid debate to have. And each, you know, each camp has really valid and, and rooted within Islamic tradition, I believe, uh, perspective on how do you engage with, with power. But the level of discourse became so toxic and it continued, you know, beginning from early on in the year from, you know, that controversy I mentioned about um, International Women's and Day. Give us a flavor of the con of the toxicity of it. I mean, what, what kinds of People, language was being used? You don't need to go to the F word, but, you know, <laughs> what kinds of language was being used or what kind yeah. of accusations well, were being made that, that were so toxic? The T word was used, takfir. I mean, people were outright takfiring each other, you know, taking people outside of the community of Islam. If you attended the iftar, if you supported that, then you are not a Muslim because you are supporting a government that is droning and attacking Muslims elsewhere. Um, and, and, I mean, people were really saying, you are Uncle Tom's, you know, if you are supportive of the iftar. And, which was really interesting because Uncle Tom is coming from a particular racialized uh, history of the United States and here, you know, light-skinned Arabs calling light-skinned light South Asians Uncle Toms and taking out, you know, not even really listening to the experiences of one-third of the American Muslim population who are African-American. But that's a whole other conversation we'll, which we'll have in a few minutes, I think, and we're con continuing to have. But my point is here is that the level of discourse, there's, there's a lack of adab in disagreement. There's a lack of understanding that people, I, I would think, you know, having husn al having this um, assumption of of good faith on the part of other Muslims, saying that we want to reach a particular goal. We want to be able to, to hold our government as citizens to a particular standard. How do we do that? And, and if we have valid disagreements, how can we disagree with each other in a way that that's not attacking one another? And, you know, I attended an Islamic school, so I'm all about the ahadith that I learned that, or, you know, trained in me as a child. And one of them, one of the ahadith that I learned is, um, that the Muslim ummah is like a body, right? It's like one corporal body. And what I'm seeing is that, you know, the hand, the arm over here is like pummeling the left leg and the leg is like reaching over and hitting you in the back while the outside world is, you know, throwing radiation on us. Right? And, and, and I'm thinking, why are we doing this to each other? Why aren't we trying to take care of the body before we sort of move outward? Thank you. Uh, and, uh, Imam Jihad, did you, did you want to weigh in on this or do you want to take it in a different direction? No, I just want to, you know, say... Keep the first, mic a little bit closer to you. Make sure it's on. Yeah. Okay. I want to first of all say keep that... Close, uh, keep it closer. Okay. All right. That's a lot of maneuvering. I taught him a public, peak, public speaking course uh, at Bayan and... Uh, this is this not was class. Technique, this was number... <laughs> this was a si homework assignment number one, Imam Jihad. All right. No, alhamdulillah. No, I want to first of all say that... Uh, uh, of course, doing anything in the Muslim community, you're going to be met with criticism. You know, that's, that's just, uh, you know, that comes along with the territory. But I also, you know, I want to comment as far as, um, 
I think what's happening more and more, especially with our organizations, is that we're working against each other. You know, we're not consulting each other when we make these decisions. So my question would be, of course, to the leadership of Impact, did the leadership of Impact consult communities of color to get some direction as far as the implication of giving an award to such an individual? Because I think what's happening even, I mean, I've seen uh, panels, I've seen conventions, you know, people who are discounted, um, who have a wealth of experience in the American Muslim community. You have many African American imams who have been here, who have experienced uh, certain things that they can give some uh, consultation to some of these organizations who make decisions as such. But they're discounted and their experience is pushed aside. And I think that's where we felt at as a Muslim community. You know, as a Muslim community, I've seen uh, you know, us experience 9-11 uh, without consulting each other. And this is, you know, in the Quran, وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالْحَقْ You know, this is this mutual consultation in truth and patience. It's not just practicing patience or practicing the truth as individuals, but we have to consult one another. So when these decisions are being made, and I think it's on, uh, you know, both sides, you know, of the spectrum. You have, uh, you know, a variety of organizations doing the same thing. You know, where we're not, we are not consulting each other, we are not sitting down with one another before these decisions are being made. You know, so I would ask us, you know, especially, uh, you know, organization uh, leaders to begin to consult each other, learn the sensitivities and what could be the potential results of making decisions as such. And of course, you know, this is nothing new to uh, you know, impact. Impact has been here before. They've experienced this criticism before. So perhaps you all, you know, knew this was coming. But <laughs> there's another side, I think, in moving forward into the future. Let us sit down with one another and consult each other before making such decisions. Yeah. You, you know, this this. This brings up, uh, to, to interject some of the comments from the audience, this brings up um, a related question I didn't hear anyone talk about so far, uh, and that has to do with the economic disparity and the, and the social status uh, and, uh, between, and disparity between immigrant communities and African American communities. So the question here has to do with uh, what kind of work, in addition to the, sim symbol the symbolism of, of conventions and, and awards and things like that, but on the ground having to do with transforming the economic reality uh, for uh, impoverished Muslim communities and, and particularly communities of color. What, you know, what, what do any of you have to say about the economic uh, disparity, not just the issue of racism? Because this has to do with what Muhammad Fadl talked about, the institutionalization of uh, some of the, some, some of the, you know, that, that serves as the foundation of the, of the, of the uh, ongoing uh, grievances that exist in, in many of these communities. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, interestingly, you know, in February 1968, a, uh, a report that came out that kind of shook the nation. And in many ways, it was precipitated by a series of riots from Watts, uh, Detroit, across the country. Martin Luther King, I mean, this was only several months before his assassination, he would call this. Uh, I think the, the term that he talked about was this was a, physici a physician's warning of an approaching death, right, and a prescription for life. And he was referring to the Kerner Commission report, right, which in 1968 came out and definitively said something that obviously was increasingly an obvious reality in America at that time, that America, the, f the most famous line is two s nations, right, separate and unequal, black and white. Um, now, we're almost now coming on the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report, and while there's been extraordinary progress on so many levels in the United States, uh, if anything, these sets of protests and riots across the country continue to underscore the realities that there is still a very divided nation, and it is divided structurally, socioeconomically, in really profound ways. I think the Muslim community has an opportunity right now to have the type of conversation we're having, to make sure that the hashtag Black Lives Matter, right, 
becomes more than a hashtag, becomes more than a two, three month kind of fad that we get, and that we begin to start thinking about where is our role in, in meaningfully sustaining structural solutions, right? From a policy level, from an investment level, and it, it does have to be more than symbolic. It does have to really, and it does require us to have the type of difficult conversations that we're having. And I think Black Lives Matter is an important hashtag because it is an important challenge to our community. Look, again, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the level of being real, our communities, and, and that's why I know sometimes the criticism that you know, Hind is referencing on social media, it gets very shrill and it gets very you know, uh, uh, emotional. But you know, the Prophet Sallallahu had to engage that. Different people came to the Prophet Sallallahu different in different capacities. I mean, one man came and grabbed him by his neck, al Sini Ya Rasulullah, right? These one man comes and, you know, they engage from different backgrounds and different contexts. The Prophet Sallallahu understood different people are coming from different experiences, you know, and that required a different approach. And I think we need to be honest about where we are now and if we can get to the, and becoming part of structural solutions, and we can't really get to that point until we recognize the type of spiritual maladies we have, including racism in our community and Hind, among the things that she did, over the last year was lead a, a social media campaign that helped to surface terms, particularly in the Arab and Palestinian serious community, the use of, for instance, the word Abid to reference African Americans, the deployment of that. And, and that was not just a linguistic slip of the tongue, that, that was systematically indicative of just a whole different way in which one sector of our community looked to a larger sector of African Americans. And having honest conversations about that, I think, was critical. So, so I'm going to ask uh, Marwa to jump in here. But uh, I know that you, if you wanted to tap, tail, uh, tag on to exactly yeah. what he was saying really quickly, but I wanted to give Marwa a chance. And I have a, Please I wanted to open, open it up for you to, to comment more generally, but there is a couple of questions that are coming specifically for you as well. I also wanted to well. say something quickly about this too. All right, so Jihad, okay. Hind, Marwa, go ahead. Yeah, so on a basic level, I think just dealing with the racial profiling that takes place in the masjid, <laughs> in our mosque, I think is important because I, we have, of course, on a societal level, this is nothing new. You have 1991, uh, the killing of uh, Latasha Harlan, that resembles Trayvon Martin of uh, 2012. And then you have, uh, you know, the situation uh, that's happening today, the Eric Garners. This is, of course, resembling 1992, uh, Rodney King. We have in our masjid, this has been taking place too, you know, as far as this racial profiling. I went to an event more recently. I took some of the youth in uh, my community African-American youth to an event, uh, to an actual camp, uh, you know, with individuals, with young uh, youth uh, from Pakistani background, also out of background. And one of the youth commented to the youth that, one of the other youth that I uh, bought, and he said, well, you look like someone who's coming here to sell me something, <laughs> referring to sell me some drugs. This is taking place in the Muslim community, the complaints that I get from individuals of the African-American community who say I went to a masjid and there was no hospitality. There's no hospitality. So if we can start there by employing hospitality in our local masjid, then we can talk about you know, changing policy and everything else. But let us deal as far as on a, a level of building our relationships, as we come from different backgrounds, we have much to bring to the table with our experiences, with our resources and everything else. Let us build that relationship with one another in our masajid, although we come from different backgrounds, and let us start by increasing hospitality in our masajid. Amen.
I'm excited to talk about Masajid, um, which I think is going to be sort of the next topic. We're going to transition, and, and Marwa is going to have a lot to say about she that. Will. So she's been very patient. Uh, thank you, Marwa. But um, very quickly, I do I, I do some work in Western Europe as well in terms of anti-racism and immigration, and one of my friends there, who is a, a South Asian Muslim doctor, uh, who's from Britain, he told me he commented. He said, you know, why is it that you American Muslims are such bourgeois? He said, why don't you care about anything? that the working man cares about. Why don't you, you know, hold your government account to account for it for the poor? Um, and this is somebody, if he was here in the U.S., he might be one of those bourgeois Muslims. And I told him, listen, you know, a lot of the Muslims that you interact with, and, you know, I understand I'm also coming from a place of privilege. I go to Europe for my work. Um, but a lot of the Muslims that he engages with are coming from a particular echelon, uh, economic echelon in the United States. And what what I tell him and what, what I remind myself and, and ourselves here is that the U.S. actually has the most diverse Muslim community in the world. And not just diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, which is very obvious, but also looking at the economic background, the sectarian background, the linguistic background, the, in terms of the spectrums that we're in, in terms of um, you know, Salafi to Sufi and everything in between. And we have got to figure out a way to work together, right? And, and you know, I'm really excited about talking more about in terms of what are the processes that we can do and how can we learn from one another as a community. But this is something that we should really think about in terms of, you know, if you are coming from a privileged background, well, how, um, how are we with the Quran? How are we with our divinely inspired, our divine sacred amana? to our brothers and sisters who are Muslim or who are not Muslim, who are not coming from our particular economic or educational backgrounds. And I think, I personally think that the mosques and the institutions are the first places that we should begin to think about this and to unpack this, this privilege. So to mosque or to unmosque? I mean, that transitions us on to Marwa. Uh, so so, so uh, we, we were talking a little bit, and I was fascinated by uh, not just the work that you've done in the documentary, but the way that you framed the, 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 the conversation about the role of the mosque in our community. So I'm just going to uh, let you comment on whatever you want, since you've been so patient, and go uh, into uh, transitioning a little bit into institutional um, structure that could uh, possibly address issues of race and power and economics and spirituality as well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. It's very nice to be here. Uh, so when we're discussing this institutional change, we obviously know that institutional ch change takes a long time. And relatively, we're a very young community from the immigrant background. The African-American community has been here much longer than we have, obviously. So we have to consider the idea of um, the constitution of the masjid, right? And do we even know what the constitution states? Do we know the bylaws of the constitution? Do we know who the board members are and how to become members of, of our board uh, and, and uh, vote for our board members? So a lot of that is not transparent. We don't have financial transparency, for example. And one of the issues, I think, in order to understand where some of the millennial generation is coming from and their disengagement with the masjid, is, is the fact that we are now looking at a decentralized way of attaining our spiritual and uh, Islamic knowledge. So I like to use the metaphor of having a Walmart, a Walmart version versus an Amazon version. And for millennial, for millennial Muslims, a lot of it has to do with, I'll pick the best place, my third space, to get my socialization, and I'll pick Bayina TV to get my Islamic knowledge, and I'll go to, um, you know, a, a Sufi circle to get my spiritual upliftment. And that no long, the masjid is, not, is no longer a place where I can have this centralized place that fulfills all those roles. Um, so I think that in order to understand the psyche of where we're coming from, we have to understand that within the Muslim gener American Muslim context, it, we can't separate it from American history. Like uh, what Hind was saying last night when we were having dinner, she said, we, have, we make our own religion in some ways, like the idea of manifest destiny, for example. And so we enjoy being, having this information overload of like, I'm going to Yelp 
uh, before I go to a restaurant. And we have this, so we have all of this knowledge, but we're going to pick and choose what is it beneficial to us as, a, as an individual as opposed to uh, the broader general population. And I think that uh, this may be more theory, but it's really important to understand like that psyche, right? Because how are we going to galvanize around issues when we're not a centralized ummah, so especially you, in the American you, community? I'm going to inter interject here because I'm interested in what you're saying. Are, are you suggesting then that the mosque is now passe, irrelevant? It's is it just? It's no it, longer sexy. It's no longer sexy. All right. <laughs> I don't know which masjid you went to, but I've never been to a sexy masjid. Um, <laughs> The, um, so, but the role of the masjid is not, it's no longer, not only is it no longer central, it might, might not even be that important other than just the five daily prayers, is that, or even that? Well, I mean, obviously the Friday prayer because it's mandated, but how many people would go to the Jummah prayer if it wasn't a, a, a divinely ordained uh, thing to do. No right? one raised their hand. All right. So, but that. <laughs> but, so, so in that regard, let's think about how, how do we have Muslims who are in their 40s or who are in their late 30s and they still haven't had the chance to be on the board of their masjid. Yet we have uh, many elders who, we have a founder syndrome, right? Once they hold on and they see they built this brick and mortar and may God reward them for all of the work that they put in, uh, there's no transition. And so the millennial generation doesn't have the mentorship from the Gen, Gen Xers, for example. And it, it seems like the divide is now much larger. So, so are you suggesting then that it's because there's so much to uh, overcome by way of entrenched cultural attitudes, not just in terms of uh, founder syndrome and, and holding on to power, but also attitude towards women? Right. Because there's been so, a number of questions about the role of women yeah. or the the exclusion of women. I know this is the focus of your of your blog side entrance. Uh, side entrance, of course, referring to the place that the women go into the mosque. They don't come in through the front door. They go in through the side if they're lucky. Um, and sometimes it's a basement. Sometimes and there's some incredible pictures. You should check out uh, uh, Hin's blog. But um, are you saying that it's so much to overcome that? Let's just ditch it and start over. It's easier to start from scratch. And, I, and you know, speaking from personal experience, when I was in the Bay Area, we created Amila back in 1992 for that exact reason. When, we, when I started serving at the, at the director at the Islamic Center in 2005, we created Mecca SoCal to, not to undermine or to uh, make irrelevant the Islamic Center or to give up on the Islamic Centers or the mosque, but to augment mm -hmm. with those additional needs that weren't being met at the mosque and to also to groom uh, additional, you know, potential leaders that could come and reform. So is it, is it something, is it a project yeah. worth investing in or should we just start from scratch in other uh, areas and then hope that the mosque will eventually catch up? What's your formula that you're... So I, I mean, I don't have a specific formula because every community is different and it would be unfair to say, you know, maybe you're able to work within your community and affect change and maybe you can have a third space that complements your masjid. Uh, maybe you have to start completely over because you've invested 15 years in your masjid and have yet to see women, women on the board uh, or it's against the constitution to have women on the board. So these are issues that are specific to each community, but what I've seen are, is the fact that there are barriers upon barriers upon barriers. And I'm going to share two personal stories um, in terms of the women issue. Uh, when I, I grew up in Westbury, Long Island, the masjid there, the Islamic Center of Long Island, and their, their structure of the masjid is that they have big open spaces. So uh, the men would pray in the front, the women in the back, there's marble that divides them. But during the Salat al Jummah, there were only chairs that separated us because the men would overflow into the women's section. So the women were fine with it. It didn't seem like a big deal. Um, and we would have maybe three or four rows if we needed a little bit more. If you know there was a day off and the kids were coming as well, we would push the, with the chairs up one row. There was one woman who came in and, she, and we would have accordion uh, doors that would close during Sunday school. But they didn't close during Salat al And so there was one woman that came in and she was flabbergasted. She said, Astaghfirullah, close the doors. How is this possible? What's going on? This is fitna. So I sat her down and I said, and this is a woman, I sat her down and I told her, you know, during the time of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was no barrier between the men and women in prayer. And she responded by saying, Alayhi salatu wasalam, I don't know about that, but I know in my country, we pray downstairs. 
Like we pray where the men don't see us. Fast forward about five years later, um, I've become a mother. I'm spiritually depleted. I have no idea what I'm doing in motherhood. I, you know, could barely look straight. You know, I'm, I'm sleep deprived. I bring blueberries, toys, everything to bring with uh, me to, uh, so Sumaya could be engaged and doesn't cause a distraction in the masjid. But I just really wanted to hear an inspirational khutbah. Like I just really needed something to hold on to for the rest of the week. I go to the masjid. Uh, the women are now um, on, on a balcony and. Everything goes well, alhamdulillah. I carry Sumaya right when we're about to pray, and then she starts crying a little bit because the adhan was so loud with the speaker system. So she was a little bit startled. startled. At the end of the, uh, of the prayer, uh, the imam, who can't see me, he said, you know, women, you can carry your children uh, so they don't have to cry during the prayer. Meanwhile, he didn't know that I was carrying her the whole time. And these may seem like small stories, but there, there is the bigger issue of uh, the structure. Like we don't have, there's no access between genders to understand what the issue is. And then there's the structure of the back home mentality, right? So we have so much unpacking to do. And it really starts by engaging both there was the mention of the water cooler conversations. So we may have these conversations internally, but we don't engage with the people that we have tension with. And that was the point of Unmask, to bring all of the, the entire community together and to say, let's have this difficult conversation and let's make Unmask the conversation starter. So you guys don't have to. So, right? so if you could plug just for a second, the, what, what, what do you, what, how do we begin if we wanted to watch the documentary, how do we, what do you what um, so we do? the documentary you could screen it you, if you would like to on uh, there's a website called unmask.com can, can you screen an unmask at a mosque that's a, yes okay, we've right. actually uh, we did 25 screenings last year most of them were between universities and masajid across and, the country and, and, and I was uh, being lighthearted but but some great conversations come out of this right. I mean it's and it, and and how has the experience been at the mosque I mean you've had I'm sure okay. leadership of mosques who yeah. maybe are feeling okay uncomfortable uncomfortable or you know this is somehow attacking how did that mm -hmm. how has that been so I'll just give received. you a small example our last screening happened in the Bay Area at the MCA a multi-million dollar facility that's done great work uh, there was about uh, there are about 500 people who had attended uh, and there was a lot of tension and Hind was there um, there was one munaqaba, a woman that wears naqab, that got up and said, the producers of this film, what they're doing is haram. Like, you have to work within the system. I get um, threats all the time, and I get criticism all the time for wearing naqab, and I still work within the system. And then on the flip side, there was a convert woman who uh, her husband had converted, and she said that my husband can't go to the masjid anymore. You know, so there was just like these polar extremes that would have never had a conversation before. He, he couldn't go to the masjid because he just wasn't He was just welcome. so disenfranchised. Hmm. Yeah, he was leading a youth group, and then they, the board would keep harping on and criticizing his events. Um, there's no structure of, uh, like there are no checks and balances within the masjid. We don't have HR, like we've grown on an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, but we don't have administration, you know? So we end up having this flat, this flat power scheme and it's not working, right? Like the, the board ends up doing a lot of the menial tasks that, it was, that it's not equipped to handle. So, so we, have a, we, have, we still have about 12 minutes left uh, before we invite our, our closing comments from uh, Imam Khaled Latif. Um, and can I, I want can this I just part mention one more thing? Sure. We have, in, in terms of like understanding the American t context, the, um, there's a 19% increase, uh, and that's the fastest growing, by the way, of people that consider themselves non-religious. So it's not just, like unmasked is not a phenomenon of just um, becoming less religious. And I would say that people are, Muslims are still holding on to their religion, um, but finding different avenues for it. Uh, but the and it's within the unchurched movement as well. But we have to understand that Americans generally are becoming less religious, and that's important in our context. So, in, in the in the time remaining, um, I wanted the the conversation amongst you to continue, and to I want you to challenge one another, you know, continue the conversation. But I want you to ask the questions of one another. So, Imam Jihad, I mean, who if you you know here you have the opportunity to, to have this conversation. And again, we're pretending that the audience isn't here. Uh, anything in their uh, comments or that they left out that you would, you would like to uh, engage any one of them on? 
Well, I think um, a lot of times, even uh, in our in the context in which I'm in uh, Imam presently, I can't relate a lot of times to the unmasked movement as far as from a particular context. So, in for example, in South Los Angeles, many of our youth are, or you know, you have a generation that is unmasked. They were caught up really in the influences of the gang culture. You know, I have uh, some of my friends that I grew up with, uh, you know, they're in prison. Some have been killed in uh, gang violence. So our challenge now in that particular context is building our institution, you know. So we can't relate necessarily to, you know, a big beautiful mosque, connected to it is a school, they have the option of having a youth program at the same time as the youth program, a women's program, at the same time a program for uh, the general audience in the masjid. I can't relate. For we come from a storefront masjid, which has one room in which the children run through this one room at the same time a program is taking place for the adults. So in that particular uh, context, you began to appreciate when you go and visit a masjid that has connected to a school, has the resources to build another part of a masjid. And I think we need a situation to where we interact and we visit each other to begin to appreciate each other's situation. So for example, if you have a group of unmasked who have access to this huge facility to come and visit a masjid Ibadullah, which alhamdulillah, we just recently had the opportunity to transition into another facility. But they need to really just come and visit and interact in order to appreciate their situation back at their uh, home mosque. And I think this is important, to which we all have our challenges in our masajid. All of us have our challenges. It's always the imam, I, that's another challenge that we can have another panel uh, on. Now, there's a lot of challenges in our communities and this interaction and this exchange and sharing our ideas, our stories is important for us to really appreciate our uh, situations. But I would say, you know, even in the community of the, uh, the unmasked, uh, some of the children of those who migrated over here, uh, I think one thing that they've missed out on, and this is from really a position of outside looking in, is that perhaps they need to increase in their social services. Uh, one thing that increases Iman is being able to apply what you learn in the Qur'an. It's one thing to read and memorize Qur'an, but perhaps going and, uh, and seeing how Islam had a transformative effect on different lives, you'll begin to appreciate your religion. You know, so for in that, for in communities, I would definitely emphasize that they go and take their youth to partake, to partake in social services. Take them to go visit the prisons. Take them to go visit uh, homeless uh, communities and everything else. And give them a platform in which they can apply their iman. And, and this touches upon one of the questions that was asked, and, and, and I want the, the rest of you to, to maybe weigh in on this or take it in another, another direction altogether. But one of the questions had to do with, you know, this American Muslim identity, how can you be both? And, and it seems that if you have the attitude that Islam is something beautiful and we mm -hmm. have something to offer society, yeah. and it's not just a matter of being comfortable in our skin and in how we're perceived, but we have a, it, it, it's not a matter of comfort, it's a matter of carrying a, a res, the responsibility of trying to transform and change and contribute to the betterment of the society in which we live. So, uh, uh, you know, again, this is a conversation, so I want the, the, the rest of you to, to, to weigh in, either on this issue or take it in another direction. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just echo a couple of those comments about the Amas. I mean, I, I greatly appreciate the project. I still think if I were to take a, a couple of things from Jihad's comments and, and, and resonate a little with me, the project and how it links to our earlier conversation for me is still the dominant narrative is still very much coming out of a 
I'd say disgruntled second generation or disconnected immigrant, not exclusively community, and it, and it some, in some cases does assume the privileges that Jihad's talking about. Not that there aren't very real issues, but I, I do think as a community, you know, because what I've seen, the reality is across the country, you know, mosques, I, I go to sometimes invited still hundreds of millions of dollars of being built for mega mosque expansions uh, across the community. And and then I'm not always convinced that the second generation folks who consider some elf mosques and creating these quote, the third spaces, they, they replicate in some cases the same pathologies because I don't think we've ever really been honest about all the levels of conversation. I, and I would agree with Jihad that the, the way this kind of relates to your, your question about larger existential identity issues. What does it mean to be Muslim in America, in the world today? I don't think it's gonna be solved by what physical space you're in, right? The, the bricks and mortar of a masjid or a place that you're labeling now a third space. I think it is getting to the word that you framed, Jihad, which was part of a spirit of Islam that in so many ways characterized what Islam in America was and what was a distinct narrative, which was that transformative narrative. Where is Islam transforming? Where are the values and the, and the, and the ideals of our tradition and our beloved, uh, uh, the, the tradition of our Prophet Sallallahu transforming space, transforming reality? And historically in America, that has been in urban communities not exclusively, but it has been in those communities around the issues that I think jihad, you know, we're, we're dealing with in South Central or South Side of Chicago, Detroit. And I think it, it goes back in my mind to re-emphasizing that work as an integral part of the Muslim American project. And, and I think it lends meaning to the American Muslim identity. Not the only meaning, but a level of really important meaning about the extraordinary value that this community has. And I think we need to be solution driven around the type of challenges that America faces and our community faces. And I don't think that those solutions just come by rejecting one type of space over the other. It comes with providing real solutions and putting them on the table. Uh, in a way that speaks to the tradition of our of our prophet also. And, and it speaks to the issue of relevance as well because you know are we perceived as a, a community that's just self-serving and and narrowly uh, focused on our own rel you know our own issues that affect us in a in an individual or personal way or are we uh, carrying a larger responsibility towards serving the greater society and and speaking up for for issues that um, affect uh, the, the general population. So I think, you know, there's an issue of relevance for our community as well. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas are, are coming to me in, in terms of, uh, you know, what I, I think we, we can focus on in terms of finding solutions. But one point that Imam Jihad mentioned was in terms of learning from one another. Um, you know, I mentioned that I went to an Islamic school. I, I didn't mention that it was in the mosque. And even though I am currently unmosked, I can see a masjid from my bedroom, but I don't go there. I actually stream uh, a khutbah if I don't drive 40 minutes out to Iman for their for their Jum'ah prayer. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I'm, I want the mosque to be relevant because I grew up in the masjid. Literally, my school was in the masjid, and that was my home away from home. However, uh, you know, I, I think that we, for me, it's this challenge of looking at, you know, the Quran tells us that God has endowed dignity, laqad karamna bani adam, not just to Muslims, but to people. As a human being, you are endowed with a dignity. And the hadith tells us that you are not a Muslim, a mu'min, and you're not a believer until you wish for your brother or sister what you wish for yourselves. So when you look, for when I look at, specifically in Chicago, the racial, the, the racial, economic, ethnic cleavages that are tearing the city apart. And we have a you know, particular issue that has broken out in the city in the last uh, week as well in terms of sexual misconduct at a very well, you know, a prestigious uh, you know, Hifidh school, a Quran school in, in the city. And all of these issues have come out. This question of who has the authority to say you are the normative Muslim, right? And this, th for me, this, this comes into the, the idea of who gets to go to the mosque and what do you, do you feel at home in the masjid? I felt at home in the masjid when I was eight. I don't feel at home in the masjid now. I'm not eight. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. But, you know, it, it, it's a sense of, you know, do you feel welcome? Do you feel like you're not going to be spiritually or physically or sexually abused at the mosque? And is there a process by which a person, whether you are somebody who goes to the masjid five times a day, once a week, 
all the time or you're somebody who's in and out, is there a process by which to tell you know, your feelings, your thoughts to whether it's a crime that has taken place allegedly or it's just feeling that you're, that you're not being spoken to, is there a process by which you're being heard and that people are not judging you, people are not saying, well, you're not Muslim enough or perhaps you're not the kind of Muslim that we want at this masjid, at this mosque, so maybe go somewhere else. And I think that goes to the, to the, to the core of saying, you know, this American Muslim community is the most diverse Muslim community problem, you know, around the world today. So who gets to say that you're the authentic Muslim, that you're practicing the authentic Islam? As we're having this internal conversation, when we have larger issues, and I really, I mean, I, I'm humbled to be sitting on a stage with Rami because the work that he and, and his staff and, and the people around Iman are doing is something that has, I think, saved the Islam of so many people in Chicago, right? So many people in Chicago will say, you know, I'm agnostic about my masjid, I'm agnostic about the community, but my spiritual community is at Iman. My, commu my spiritual community is driving 40 minutes into the city and serving people who I don't know, who are not Muslim, but that's, that's the way I'd like my Islam to transform the city. Yeah. So I think uh, the bottom line, we have uh, you know, a couple of things that we need to work on in our masajid is, of course, enhancing the hospitality uh, and then you know, moving on into doing uh, social services. You know, where we have, uh, traditionally, we have the heterodox Islamic movement, such as the uh, five percenters. You know, many people uh, came into Islam by hearing uh, Islam or something about Islam mentioned in the hip hop music. You know, and the, what motivated many of the rappers to really speak out against, uh, you know, uh, social injustices was Islam. And you have the, the Nation of Islam, you know, a, another heterodox movement. We don't definitely agree with their belief, uh, so to speak, but as far as their works, they had a program that was better than AA. They can get a person to stop drinking, get a person off of drugs, and clean them up and everything else. Perhaps we need to take a page from uh, their book. You know, we have, uh, you know, some of the, the first da'is in America. We don't agree with their aqidah necessarily, but the, uh, individuals from the Ahmadiyya movement, who they came to the people who were being oppressed. We need to go to the people who are being oppressed, realizing that Islam is not just for certain people of a certain social status, but we need to bring back that tradition of serving and benefiting the community, allowing Islam and Iman to exit from the four walls of the masjid. Um, beautiful. Um, Marwa, so, you can clap, it's okay. He's, he, so he has to train himself to be humble, so you can give him some <laughs> accolades, and that's part of the work of an Imam. He has to I learned from you, but. <laughs> So in terms of the issue of um, entitlement, and I, I just want to talk a little bit about that. When we were interviewing, we had a whole section on the African American experience. And uh, what we learned also is that, um, for example, when we interviewed Imam Khalis Rashad in Houston, Texas, he mentioned that every single, most of the African American masajid, they've been built in blighted areas. And that's because we go out and we seek those places in order to elevate the neighborhood. And wherever there's a masjid, you know that ex-convicts are being helped and that um, it, it, may not, it may be a humble space, but in reality, we do a lot of work in community building. We help them start small businesses. And this was a very inspirational, narrative that we hadn't heard from the other communities. Um, so when I talk about like that idea of it's no longer sexy, it's not coming from like, and I, it may a little bit come from privilege, but it's also coming from, because we grew up with this idea of this transformative narrative and we're not hearing it, it's not reverberating on the walls of the masjid. So yeah, it could be a multi-million dollar facility, but it's empty. Like we could barely fill a line for Fudge. We could barely fill two lines for Aisha. And it's not because, oh, well, it's I just don't relate to the older generation it's because there hasn't been this uh, way forward or this like clear process and that's what I think the point of Unmasked was is to give voice to the voiceless to give voice to the disenfranchised to give voice to those that wouldn't have had a platform otherwise um, and, and so that was just a little bit maybe I didn't 
I wasn't clear in what the motivation was for it, but it, what, it did focus a, a lot on the convert experience, the uh, African-American experience, the, the w women experience, and then what are the reactions to the, the masjid? Are these third spaces that are popping up? And I, I would consider in a man a third space. You know, it's interesting because I, I once was speaking not, not long ago in front of it. It was an MSA thing. It was maybe around 400 kids that were gathered, very sharp. I had asked them, um, it, it, was, it was around the time of MLK. We were talking about that. And we were talking about it in the context of other examples. I had asked the room, um, you know, who was familiar with the leadership of Imam Wardin Muhammad and some of the models. And mm -hmm. Wallahi, probably no less than maybe 10 hands went up in this entire room. And the reason why I'm raising this is, you know, may Allah have mercy on him, but what we need to do a better job of, and this goes to back to our original conversations about race, about this kind of honest collaboration, Jihad's initial kind of both challenge and suggestion to impact about collaboration, we need to lift up better models, moments in our history, right? Um, Kenny Gamble in South Philly is relatively an unknown name in the Muslim community. Although he's transformed, probably has one of the most radically empowering and inspirational transformative urban development program in the country. Why don't we know about that? Why don't we know about moments, even whether, you know, put Aqidah and conversations aside, the Ahmadiyya collaboration. And it's not just about lifting up the kind of one sector of the African American experience. It's about moments, you know, it's that Kashmiri uncle that came into a program, barely spoke English, invested, you know, in a program and put his effort, his heart, his money where his mouth was. I mean, we don't, you know, it's great to have rallies. It's great to kind of have chance. But I'm more interested in people who are going to put it on the line and demonstrate that they are ready to invest. And we've had those stories, but we don't lift them up. We don't celebrate them. We don't make them part of our curriculum. We pretend like, you know, again, we, everything has to have seventh century Islamic form to have substance. And then we wonder why our kids, when they're being enticed by a, kind of a sexy, uh, you know, 2.0, you know, hyper up glossy media machine from ISIS, why they're, you know, with all the hadith and all the nasheed and the images of a 7th century Arabia being reenacted in Raqqa, why they're attracted to that? Because they haven't been given the alternative. They haven't been given the stories of, of Muslims who have been making impact. And, I, and we're going to hear from Dr. J earlier, you know, later in the day. But I think it's really taking the work of people like Dr. Jackson, the kind of that false universal, and taking that seriously and saying, look, we have within our capacity the ability to make difference. We've had made differences. We need to lift those up, celebrate those examples, and say that this is an embodiment of what our community can do. Uh, and I think that gets beyond some of the conversation about one space or the other, and it gets us towards solutions. You know? Beautiful. So uh, you might have noticed I went a little bit over, and that's because I got permission from someone in the higher ups to go a little bit longer because it was such an engaging conversation. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask each of you to prepare two minute, two minutes. I'm going to hold you to that closing thought. Um, and you have a little bit of time to prepare that because uh, we're going to have some reflections on all that was said and things that might not have been said from our uh, uh, next speaker, Imam Khaled Latif, who is the uh, executive director at the N uh, NYU uh, Islamic Center. So please welcome warmly. Imam Khaled Latif. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm not a very, uh, I'm not built for uh, podiums necessarily. <laughs> so the microphone goes in my hand. You can move it. I'm okay, yeah. But thanks, thanks, Salam, for affirming that I'm a short person. <laughs> <laughs> Bismillah. So the story that I was told that a lot of the comments reminded me of and what I'm hoping to kind of frame a little bit of what I'm going to talk about around involved a young man who deeply loved his family. He had a wife that he loved very much and they had a young son that was the object of their adoration and affection and the situation comes about that this young man, his mother passes away and his elderly father needs a place to stay, so he goes and lives in the home of the young man. And the elderly father is 
In constant need of attention and care, and the responsibility falls on the young man's wife, and she becomes deeply frustrated as a result of it, and she lets her husband know, I am always looking after your father's needs. I am always cleaning up his messes. Can't you do something about this? He says nothing. And then they sit down to eat dinner one night, and this elderly man is so frail, he is so fragile, the sheer weight of the plate that he is holding in his hands is too much for him to handle. It falls from his grasp onto the ground, shattering into pieces. The woman now says to her husband, the young man, that look at what your father has done now. Why don't you say something? So the young man says to his father that, From now on, you will not be able to eat at the same table as my wife, my son, and I, since you can't eat without making a mess. And since you are unable to eat from the same plates that we eat off of, henceforth you will eat from this wooden bowl. The elderly man with a tear in his eyes, he goes and does what he is told. The next day now, this young man, he comes upon his own son. He comes upon his own child, and he sees him on the ground playing with some scraps of wood. And he wants to be with his son. He wants to play with him and participate in what he is doing. So when he gets close enough, he says to him with love and affection and adoration in his voice, Oh, my son, what are you doing? And the son, reciprocating the same love and adoration and affection, says to his father, Oh, my father, I am making a wooden bowl for you to eat out of when you get older. We learn implicitly and explicitly. Whether we are conscious at times or we are unconscious of the environment and situation that we find ourselves in, the I that is uniquely me and the I that is uniquely you most definitely is impacted by every interaction that we have been blessed or more in some instances, unfortunate to have had leading up until this day. Every yesterday that we lived has bared its witness on the individual that I am at this moment, and this moment most assuredly will inform moments that come beyond this one. And I think it's important to understand because this conversation can get really big or it can start at a place where we really understand our individual role in it, And then that necessitates us understanding primarily who it is that we are and how we landed in the places that we actually are in today. It's a real crazy time because the world is getting smaller and we can actually have perspective on individuals that we have never met in our lives. And when we fail to acknowledge the fact that innately we have perspectives, we have stereotypes, we put people into boxes that they are definitely bigger than, and at times we make decisions that impact their lives without ever really having interacted with them, we end up in the situations that we're in today. And I want to really be able to think about, not just in terms of, well, I'm not doing anything wrong, but what am I actually doing at all? I was just in Houston before I came to California. I was speaking at a masjid, and I was asking people, what's the things going on here? What do you want me to talk about? One brother said to me that, you know, we have a basketball court outside of the masjid. And there was a lot of young black men who came and started to play basketball there. Until one day, someone felt that there was too many black kids, and so they said to them, some of you need to go, or we're going to call the police. It's a reality. I want you to think about it not in the frame of equity. Think about it in the frame of reality, so that discourse that we have actually manifests in actions that are viable solutions, not just let's talk about it and then go home. I sat down with another brother, his name is Mujahid Fletcher, great guy, he does a lot in terms of working with Spanish-speaking populations around the country. We had lunch yesterday and we were talking and he said, I sat down with somebody who was a big player in building all these beautiful masjids in Houston and I said, we should go and do outreach to the Spanish-speaking community. Mujahid Fletcher has got a great narrative. If you have time to sit down and read it or just talk to him, you should. It was the first time I met him. And he said, when I said to this brother, 
that we should start speaking more to the Spanish-speaking community, his response to me was, well, maybe we don't want to because then we'll have to start supporting them and give them our zakah. <laughs> but I want you to think about this. And I don't want you to think about it in a way that it's astonishing. Think about it as a reality. Think about the socialization of that individual who is in a leadership position that is, whether he is aware of it or not, enacting policy that is impacting people. And I want you to think about how you and I are potentially different. And if what we're doing actually bears any kind of difference. Because we're talking about heavy issues. We're talking about racism in our community. We're talking about gender bias in our community. We're talking about gaps in understanding classism in our communities. But if we just sit and talk and we don't do anything about it, I'm of the opinion that who really cares then? What is it that brought you here today and what are you going to take from the time that these people have left their families behind to come and talk to you about their experiences that you're going to go and start to be transformative in your own leadership? Because what's distinct is that we don't have people who truly are following the prophetic legacy. The prophet saw injustice in front of his eyes and he was conscious of his reality and when time was uh, available to him to actually do things that were institutional, he did them. But when he didn't have the clout to do it on an institutional level, he still did it on an individual level. Muhammad salam sees a companion who is beating a young boy. The companion says, I heard a voice behind me that said, God has more dominion over you than you do over this child. He turns around and he sees that as the messenger of God and there's anger on his face. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, he is free from this. And the Prophet says to him, no hesitation, that is good because had you not done so, you would burn in the fire like a piece of coal. You have the Prophet standing in a place where Abu Dhar of the Ghaffar tribe and uh, Bilal ibn Rabah are going back and forth in an argument. Emotions escalate, they get heated. Abu Dhar calls Bilal the son of a black woman. Everyone gets silent because they realize what's been said. And what's crazy is Abu Dhar is actually black. He's a black Arab. He's calling Bilal an African. And the Prophet hears it, he gets angry again. And he says, all of us are the children of a black woman, referring to Hajar, peace be upon her. The distinction is that our socialization is not just about conversations of, why is that man telling this man that we shouldn't bring Latinos in because we'll have to give them our wealth? But what I want to focus on is where is our socialization that we are not the way the prophet was, we saw that kind of injustice and we didn't spoke up against it. The gap that is missing is not that there are people who need to be re-educated, but our own individual leadership has to be reoriented and we have to truly assess, are we doing what we have ability to do? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal was the dua of the prophet. That, oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from al-ajaz and laziness. Ajaz is not incapacity or inability that says, I am unable to do something, right? Me standing strong, five foot tall, can't dunk a basketball. That's not ajaz, that's tied to istita'at. I don't have the ability to do it, it's beyond me. Ajaz is I have the ability, but I just don't do it. And the Prophet is saying that, Ya Rabb, protect me from that kind of incapacity, that kind of indifference that's rooted in a certain kind of arrogance. Why would you not do something if you had the ability to do it? Why would you not go and be something when you have full ability to be it? Aren't you tired of this kind of rhetoric that says our women are being treated like this and our brothers are being treated like that. I would ask you a question right now. You don't have to answer it. How many of you think that Sheikh Jihad's a convert? If he walked into any masjid, I don't, you know, what, how many people? You see a black person who is speaking about something. These are microaggressions that we have to deal with so that we can start to then on an institutional level deal with certain challenges that we're not dealing with. And the crazy thing is when we don't wake up to it, there is systemic persecution against people 
of our faith across the board. These guys are going to have a press conference in a little bit to talk about the CIA torture report. You know what they're doing to brown people? It's something we got to really hone in on. To me, the conversation needs to bear itself in some kind of manifested action. And I'm going to end in a way because it necessitates individual reflection and introspection. The Prophet's socialization was very key in him being a champion for women's rights and people of all backgrounds. It is not strange to me that he had companions who were of the likes of Abu Bakr, Umar, Ali, and Uthman. May God be pleased with all of them, but also Salman al-Farsi, the Persian, Abu Dhar of the Ghaffar tribe, Suhaib al-Rumi, white skin, blonde hair, blue-eyed, Bilal ibn Rabah and Khabab ibn Arath, people who were slaves of the time. Because when he was brought up, it wasn't just rhetoric, he lived diverse experiences. Between the time he was born until he was five years of age, the Prophet goes to the Banu Sa'ad tribe at the outskirts of Mecca. He grows up in Mecca. When he wants to know what happened to his father who passed away, he asks his mother. She takes him to Medina. He is with different people. He is experiencing different realities. In his own upbringing, in the absence of a father figure, he's reared by four different women, potentially even more. His own mother, Amina, a woman by the name of Thuweba, who is emancipated at the, by the prophet's uncle, who, when he hears the news of the birth of his nephew, he says, you are free, go nurse my nephew. Halima Sadia, who was a woman who nursed him and was entrusted to look after him because the Bedouins would send their children, the people would send their children to live with the Bedouins to toughen them up early on in their life. And most importantly for this conversation, a woman by the name of Um Ayman Baraka, who was arguably the only companion of the Prophet from the time he was born till the time he passes away that was with him. She was taken as a servant at 16 years of age into his home. She's an Abyssinian woman, she was black. Whenever he was opening his infant eyes and learning about love and trust and nurture, there was a woman who was not of the same skin color as his in his home. I'm going to wrap up. <laughs> it's an important conversation. Because if you don't bring it in a very practical way into your house, you don't experience it day to day, and you let it just be a conversation that happens up here, and you don't figure out how to translate it into your life, then you're going to see the same regurgitation in all the masjids. You're going to see the same regurgitation in the absence of institutions. And you got to think about what your role is in this and feel empowered to do something a little bit different. And I honestly believe that all of us have something to offer. And where Salam started is where we should end. That's what civic engagement is. You have to have the confidence in yourself to believe that you actually have something to give back. You don't wait for somebody else to do it. You see injustice, then you stand up against it, even if it's in a minute form or in a major form, and you start to be strategic. We need your talents, your skills, your resources, your know-how to build and fill the gaps that exist. And if all we do is point a finger at what's not working, we're still not doing something that goes well. So you gotta be a part of the process. I pray, inshallah ta'ala, that Allah increases the strength of everybody who's on this panel because what you all are saying is moving me to think about how disgusting of a person that I am. And you want to start to really hone in on where the conversations are. That's what being honest is about. Take a look inside and then start to see that how the world is external to you is going to be based off of how you deal with the world that's internal to you. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa billahi tawfiq wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Imam Khaled. So each of our panelists are going to say a couple words in closing. Um, and I just want to, because I've been getting a lot of questions that uh, people are, are interested in hearing about. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to touch upon all of them. Um, but I, uh, one of them was, uh, you know, what are concrete, and, and maybe you've already formulated your closing thoughts, but what are some concrete things or recommendations that you all can provide for this audience as a takeaway uh, in helping, to, helping them to be uh, change agents in their respective communities? And, and, I'll, and I'll start with, with this one thought. 
We had a, uh, a speaker come to the Islamic Center uh, a number of years ago who himself was a very well-respected professor who converted to Islam. And uh, he was, he's a professor of mathematics uh, and uh, from the Midwest, Caucasian. And shortly after he embraced Islam because he's a, you know, he's someone who's, who's uh, uh, well-read, uh, in, in intellectual, and he came to Islam through his study of the, of the religion. And he was invited by a local masjid in somewhere in the Midwest to come and tell his story of conversion. And he, gave his, he told his story to this audience, 500 uh, primarily Pakistani brothers in the audience, and uh, you know, it was a packed uh, audience. And wow, was he embraced. He told his story. He said, it took me 45 minutes just to get out the door. People were hugging me and giving me their phone numbers. And if there's anything I need, you know, uh, you know to, that I could contact them, et cetera. So he was, he was just overwhelmed with, with love and support, having told his conversion story. But he said, that's not the whole story. The other part of the story is that there was one other person on the stage with him, and it was an African-American brother from Oakland who had embraced Islam, and he was also asked to tell his story. He said the troubling part was that brother was out the door in five minutes, and he had a serious question. He said, did, did I embrace a racist religion? I mean, he asked a very poignant question, and, and so, you know, there is issues that we have in race in our community, and and, uh, and, 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 and I'm getting to the constructive part in a second, but one more uh, just to drive it home. When I was serving at the, as a religious director at the Islamic Center of Southern California, I had an intern for one year who was African American. He was studying to do his graduate degree in, in Claremont and had an internship with me where he would shadow me, he would you know, be part of the everyday life at the Islamic Center. And part of what I did on Jum'ah is I would oftentimes welcome people as they came. And he stood next to me over the course of the year and would, you know, we would be there to greet people. But the poignant thing is seeing over and over again people coming, greeting me, welcoming me, smiles, hugs, and his hand would be extended, people would walk right by. It was so painful. It was so painful. We have uh, a lot of room to grow in our community to overcome some of these issues. And uh, what I was gonna say as a constructive comment in, in, as a possible step forward for how we can address this is to have a serious conversation as families regarding marriage. Because I think that one of the, one of the most uh, constructive things we can do to bridge that gap of race is to allow our children and ourselves, if you're not yet married, to uh, encourage them to marry across these kinds of gaps, these kinds of uh, uh, barriers, ethnic and, and racial uh, barriers in our community. Uh, I've seen firsthand a number of times where the young people wanted to get married and the families intervened and prevented it because of issues of race. And this is something that we can do constructively to uh, bridge that gap. So all, those are my cl closing ideas, uh, and, I, and I'll just, we'll just go down the line. So we'll start with you, Hint. So, uh, so briefly, I think, you know, I, I focus a lot of my talk today or my, 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 my comments on kind of the ideas of words and, you know, this adab of disagreement and that online space where people are hashing out these issues. And, you know, I, I have a website, you know, that, that I am, you know, holding out so that people can have an online conversation for a couple of reasons. One is that, you know, young people are online anyway. This is a space where a lot of people feel comfortable, unlike, you know, some of mosques and institutions. But also because when you take a conversation online, it becomes democratized. People across, you know, racial, cultural, economic backgrounds can come and say, well, I have experience in this, that, and the other. This has been my experience. These are, this is my area of expertise, and the conversation becomes equalized in that way. Now, 
the, 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 the action item there, though, is to really respect that area of expertise. So I've been working on a couple of issues. We've talked about mosques for a while, but also there's an organization called Muslim ARC, the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative. Now, this is a, an organization that has, and, and Rami, when you talked about earlier, that this, this idea of trying to eradicate the term abid from the lexicon of a lot of Arab Americans, which, by the way, I, am, I identify as an Afro-Arab, so imagine being African, the daughter of an African woman with a sister named Thuweiba, by the way, um, and attending an Arab mosque and hearing this word all the time. When I would bring it up to people, I'd call them out, are you really seriously using the Ain word in front of me? And the response almost unanimously is, oh, we don't mean you, we mean the Americans as if that makes it okay. And I said, well, actually, one, it doesn't make it okay. And two, you do mean me. You're just you know, saying that to my face right now. But later on, what would you say? But in any case, Muslim Ark, this organization, what it does is it hosts online conversations every month about issues like you know, European American identity, Latino American identity, you know, being black and Muslim. But in addition to that is we develop curriculum that people can actually have in their mosques, in Islamic schools, where people can, one, talk about these issues in real life, because I think there needs to be a bridge between having this online space, online conversation, to actually implementing something in your, in your circle of friends, in your community, um, and among your family. Um, and so we offer these resources for people to do that. And, and I think that's, that's what I want to close with, is this idea of saying, we have to have honest conversations. I still will say we should do it with adab, and there should be an adab of disagreement, but we should then be able to take these issues respecting the expertise that people have across racial lines, across um, you know, cultural backgrounds or sectarian backgrounds and saying, oh, well, you have a PhD in anthropology. Well, maybe I should listen to you then about what you're saying about race, even if you are black or even if you are Latino, right? And then actually respecting that of our brothers and sisters across the racial line. And finally, you know, I you mentioned that I went to an Islamic school. It's a great school. We also learned you know, poetry and English, and I just want to close with a poem that I'm always very inspired by, by Edwin Markham, um, and it's called Outwitted. It says, he drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. Thank you. Uh, so Bismillah, again, I want to thank uh, Impact for, for allowing us to have a very frank and open conversation. I want to start by saying, you know, last, the night of the Ferguson uh, deliberations, um, I had left Iman, went back to my house, put the kids to sleep, and was sitting there watching my Twitter feed with the hashtag Ferguson waiting, 1130, 1120, and of course, the devastating but not surprising verdict came out. Um, I was struck that moment with what am I going to do? Because um, you know, I had lots of intense feelings. And the first thing that came to mind was, you know, I started again looking on Twitter and saw that people were gathering downtown at a couple of places. I was, OK, that's where I'm going to go. I'm, I'm just, I have to voice it. But I said, I, I want to go with, I, I need, I'm going to go ahead and grab a couple brothers right in the neighborhood with me, right around Iman. So there had been this young brother that immediately came to mind. He was around 22, always very, he'd been, he's been volunteering at our health clinic, working, you know, with our campaign, with the corner store campaign. He's there every time, really, you know, he's very dignified, young brother, keeps himself well, took his shahada maybe a couple years ago and been very much part of the trenches. I said, let me call Qadir. I'll just take him with me. I called Kadir, and I said, I, I said, where are you? I, he said, um, I'm, I'm driving, I'm, I'm riding the red line. I said, why are you riding the red line? And the, one of our L's, he said, well, I'm on my way to Pacific Gardens. And turns out he'd been riding the red line without me knowing, or a couple people knowing, for the last three months because he had been homeless. And staying up all night 
getting a bite to eat at a Christian missionary spot, Pacific Gardens, and then coming back and volunteering and working in Iman all day. And just being around Muslims, they never asked us one once. And I said, uh, stay where you are. I immediately went and got him. We have a program called Green Reentry. We have a home for formerly incarcerated, but we have a deliberation process. Every brother has to go through an interview process with the people from the home before they're admitted. I called a midnight convening of the brothers. I said, get to the Iman office right now. We went, the brother was interviewed, and he, he was placed as a resident in the home with both a constructive curriculum and a training program. Now, I thought about, we never got down to the protest that night, but this brother that I wanted to take to the protest ended up being homeless and through that process was placed in something that could actually change his life. Now I wanna say that not just about lifting up the Iman program, one last thing, that home that we were running we received a $25,000 check to be able to open up that home from a Pakistani immigrant brother that had once visited us. And out of the blue, we didn't know him, was taken on a tour. The next day, very anonymously, gave us a check. And then two days later, wrote us this profound email that the, after that night that he visited, he had a dream of his father, who was a migrant from Pakistan and India in 1948, and his grandfather, who as a refugee sought refuge in a home for those who were fleeing, who were kicked out of their lands from India into the new formerly for Pakistan, and he, had, and he was homeless, but had someone to take him in. And in that minute, his story resonated with the story of the brothers, and not, not only did he write a check to allow us to open up that home that now houses that young brother, in the native city of Detroit, three years later, he went and partnered with local African American communities to now replicate that program that now has opened up five similar homes in Detroit. What I'm saying is that, you know, the moment that we are living in is critical. I believe it is a Kerner Commission report. And I do believe that the type of, you know, criticism that MPAC has received and has taken with. Uh, a sense of grace is warranted by people who are very much moved by the issues of our time. And I think whether it's immigration, whether it's national security, our criminal mass incarceration, these are real issues. And we need to be out in the streets. But we also are a community that I continue to believe has this extraordinary cap capacity of love, of empathy, of transformation. And we need real ideas that can take real solutions and put them into practice so that Black Lives Matter is not a temporary hashtag, but is part of the spirit that our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought as a mercy to not only the, to, to this to, to the seventh century Arabia, but to the entire world. So, Sanawa. So no so that was very powerful. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Rumi. Um, so when we were talking, when we were discussing the, this issue of a potential solution being a, the marriage across cultural lines, across racial lines, I wanted to give a brief story about the time of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Zayd ibn, ibn Haritha, who was a slave, and he was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, slave, um, until the Prophet freed him and made him his son. Uh, he was told to marry Zainab, who was the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad. So she comes from a very elite tribe in the Quraysh. She comes from Banu Hashim. And Zaid comes from slave origins. And so he, um, he wasn't comfortable with the idea of marrying Zainab, and nor was Zainab comfortable with that idea of marrying Zaid. But because it was pushed on by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they decided to get married. And this was something that was considered very radical at the time, right? That they're crossing class, class lines, class divides, and, um, and getting married. And so they had, uh, to be honest, a very rocky marriage. Uh, it lasted about a year until it was divinely ordained that the Prophet would now marry Zainab and saying that even though you call him your son, he is not your son, right? That's in the Quran. So when we think about these ideas of taking radical movements forward, 
We could say that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, took a very radical move by instating the marriage of Zainab and Zayd. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it even further because if you imagine within the culture of the Quraysh, that would be crazy, right? To marry um, your, the ex-wife of your alleged son. So when we think like we can barely do anything to push anything forward or what power do we have, we understand that when we go one step forward, Allah comes running to us. When we go walking to him, he comes running to us. So we can't underestimate the value that each individual has. And at the same time, we have to focus, as opposed to the brick and mortar, we have to focus on community building. When we were discussing the idea of what institutions will you will forever be remembered. There are a couple that I can think of, but when I think of what are the, the giants within our history with it, w currently, you always think of these transformative people who, had, who spent so much time on character development, who had spent so much time developing others, and you say, wow, their legacy has lived on. When you think of the Sahaba, their legacy has lived on for ages. If you could just imagine on the Day of Judgment when they're up facing Allah and they understand that this whole Ummah they were a part of that, and they were the sabiqun, they were the leaders of that. And I'm sure they will feel so overwhelmed with joy. And we could be a part of that history, we could be a part of that narrative. It just takes these small, sincere steps. Um, and you know, a lot of people, we had a lot of backlash when it came to Unmasked. It, only, it was only my husband and I and one other person that did this full-length documentary. And so people were saying, this is slacktivism, this is that, this is this. But as um, Sheikh Jihad was saying, if you're going to get involved within the Muslim community, oftentimes you should be prepared for that backlash. Um, and, and so it does take a strong spirit, but as long as you principally agree with what you're trying, the message you're trying to push forward into breaking down these isms of racism and, and classism and sectarianism, sectarianism, then inshallah, Allah will meet you even further and will spread it, the message even further. Um, and, and inshallah, this will be an empowering way that we can move forward, not to belittle any small action that you do. Thank you. Sheikh and Imam Jihad, go ahead. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I, I want to first of all say that, you know, these are very historical times, you know, and I, I thank Allah to be, you know, living during these, uh, these times. And, you know, I appreciate that I'm around to experience, perhaps, of course, it's not all positive, but I'm around to experience our experience as a Muslim community during this day and time. And I'll give you an example of, you know, my current situation or my community's current situation in which I went around, uh, you know, pitching this idea, uh, just talking about and telling the story of the inner city masajid, how we are really confined to this storefront masjid. And we are in times now where we are losing the Muslims in those areas. And we need to perhaps uh, enhance our programming. Also, we need to enhance our facility, but we don't have the resources. So I went around to a variety of Muslim communities just talking about the story of many of the African Americans uh, experienced during this day and time. And alhamdulillah, I ran into some individuals who were willing to fund uh, the ideas that we didn't have the resources for. Individuals who, their parents migrated here from Pakistan, and they were willing to put forth the money, but not have control over the project. And I'm grateful that we were able to make that collaboration. And I think it's important that we make those collaborations during this day and time. We collaborate with everything else. When we go out and buy a Pepsi, this is the collaboration. Someone had to drive that product to that store. Someone had to sell you that product. And you're collaborating with individuals you don't know. But alhamdulillah, to have that opportunity to collaborate with individuals who believe in Allah 
Just like my community believes in Allah and who are willing to give but not control the product and who after they give say, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And alhamdulillah, we are organization Islah LA. Allah mentions in the Quran, there's no good in our secret talks. All these secret talks that we perhaps direct towards each other, when we talk about each other, except that we engage in acts of goodness, or islah bayna nas, bringing people together, bringing people together, building relationships and not destroying relationships. So we have, alhamdulillah, because of this collaboration, Islah Academy. Islah Academy is a school that uh, accommodates pre-K through sixth grade. But this is not just any Islamic school. We have about 36 children. Half of the children, and this was not planned, are from the nation of Islam, the nation of Islam. And the other half are Sunni, or claim to be on the Sunnah. When the children run around and play together, they don't know the differences. They see each other both as being Muslims. They don't know the differences. But somehow, when we get older, we gather more knowledge, this is when we engage in these debates and everything else, which leads us to abandon our willingness to collaborate with one another. My message really is that we have this obligation of islah bain and nas bringing people together. We have also islah LA, in which we go out and we uh, conduct social services in the community, realizing that the old model of a masjid that sits and on some corner, and it becomes that building of mystery where the neighbors say, what do they do in there? That is no longer acceptable. We have to come outside of our masajid and begin serving the people. So this message of islah, collaboration, bringing people together is one of utmost importance. So at our masajid, let us go back to our, our local masajid and began to enhance our hospitality. It's no longer acceptable. Do not approach me asking, when did I convert to Islam? That's no longer acceptable. Do not approach me asking, how did you learn the Arabic language? I have a mind just like you. This is important. We need to learn this cultural sensitivity. Don't ask me, what is my real name? I was born jihad. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I think, these are the things, it's not easy being in a communal situation. Perhaps many of us, all we just lack is training. We've never been trained to be in the community. And this is where us in this room have the opportunity to go back to our masajid and begin to train the people on enhancing hospitality. Don't abandon one another. Do not abandon one another. Perhaps we're just victimized by our own ignorance and our own, our own inefficiency as far as in being trained. So go back and train your community and spread the word and do not abandon each other and remember to build relationships with each other and not destroy relationships with one another.